Hello and welcome everyone to this, our 13th meeting of the virtual seminar series on central banking and digital currencies. Our host institution this month is the BIS. And with that, I'll turn things over to our moderator, John Frost. Thanks a lot, Todd. So today we're going to hear a great topic. Um, uh, we're going to hear from Zimon Meyer from, uh, from Chicago um, with, on a joint paper uh, with, uh, with Will Kong on the coming battle of digital currencies. I think this is very timely, uh, given uh, given all of the debates that uh, that we're having, even even this week. Um, we have uh, 25 minutes for um, for uh, Zimon to present, uh, and uh, he's let us know that if we have questions, you can feel free to enter these um, at at any time in the Q and A box and in the chat. Uh, we'll then turn to our um, discussant, who is uh, Jesus Villaverde um, from the uh, University of Pennsylvania, uh, Wharton. Uh, 10 minutes uh, for Jesus uh, as the discussant, and then we'll have the opportunity for, uh, for open Q&A um, at the end. Um, yeah, with that, I'd like to uh, turn straight over uh, to Zimon uh, to start us off and to present the paper. Uh, Zimon, the floor is yours, 25 minutes. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, John, for introducing me. Thanks, everyone, for attending this, and thanks uh, for all the hosts here for facilitating this presentation, for giving us the opportunity to present this paper, this great forum. So let me get started. So today I'm presenting my work with Will Tsong, The Coming Battle of Digital Currencies. And the motivation of this paper was partially some trends, but partially also the panel discussion I saw on this forum like uh, a few weeks back between Gary Gorton and uh, Katrin Assenmacher and so on and Ryung Chun Shin. But the uh, more topical in uh, the motivation based on trends is the following. In the recent years, we have observed the rise of private payment systems such as Alipay, PayPal or M-Pesa. And these private payment systems have gained widespread adoption, have alerted regulators in some countries. More recently, cryptocurrencies, stable coins, and decentralized finance have shown the potential to cause further disruption to the financial or monetary system. To give you some numbers, in November 2021, the cryptocurrency market cap has surpassed 3 trillion US dollars. Obviously, it's less now after the crash. And stable coins, a specific form of cryptocurrencies which are packed to a fiat currency have emerged as a new form of private money and have somewhat grown important having reached a market cap of about 180 billion US dollars. These trends and developments have clearly attracted the interest of policymakers and regulators around the globe. To give you an example of that in the context of the US, on the 9th of March, 2022, President Biden signed an executive order on digital assets in which he urged federal agencies to more actively research digital currencies, their regulation, as well as the development of a digital dollar. Related to that, a growing number of central banks around the globe are actively researching CBDC, i.e. central bank digital currencies. The following map gives you an idea about the state of the CBDC initiatives around the globe. The fact that most of this map is colored essentially means that most central banks around the globe are at least researching the launch of their own CBDC, if not having already developed a proof of concept, a pilot, or even launched CBDC. One country that's pretty much ahead in these pursuits is China with its e-renminbi or ECNY. Interestingly, the development of the ECNY together with other internationalization efforts of China has also fueled some discussions in the US. Some of the opinions in these discussions, certainly not all, also reflected the concern that with the ECNY, the renminbi could challenge the US dollar dominance. There's an article about that from Ehrlich 2020 in Forbes, titled, Not a Cold War, China is using a digital currency insurgency to unseat the dollar. Competition for fiat currency might not necessarily come from cryptocurrency as we know them now. There might be also some large scale private digital currency initiatives backed by large companies or big tech companies. One example of that was Facebook's Libra, which eventually never got through, also because it faced like very much headwind from regulators. All of these trends and developments raise many intriguing and important questions. For instance, how does this coming battle of digital currencies shape the future of money and currency competition? And should countries implement CBDC? And if so, which countries benefit the most and why? And what are the relevant trade-offs to implementing CBDC or to currency digitization more broadly? 
And we also would like to ask, what is the role of cryptocurrencies, stablecoin, and these private payment providers such as PayPal or Alipay in all of these developments? And in this paper, we actually develop a framework that helps us think about these trends and developments and helps us address these questions in a systematic way. With our framework, we also can rationalize recent events and trends in digital currency development. And notably, our key contribution is to provide a game theoretic analysis of countries' strategies of digitizing their money. Let it be by upgrading the current pay system or let it be by launching CBDC. To give you a globe more idea of what we are doing, let me give a brief overview of our model. Essentially, we develop a model of dynamic currency competition between two national fiat currencies, A and B. Think of A as the strong currency or the reserve currency, i.e. the US dollar, and think of B as a rel relatively weaker, potentially strong, but non-dominant currency, i.e. the US, uh, the renminbi or the euro. In addition to that, there is one representative cryptocurrency which serves as an imperfect substitute for these fiat currencies. And this representative cryptocurrency broadly describes also stable coins, which are cryptocurrency back to a fiat currency, or can also provide other payment systems that uh, resemble this type of um, currency. In our model, these three currency then fulfill the three functions of money, i.e. they potentially serve as a store of value, medium of exchange and provide liquidity service and unit of account. And cryptocurrency is hereby an imperfect substitute for the fiat currency. Notably, the cryptocurrency sector or the cryptocurrency convenience dynamically grows as cryptocurrency is adopted over time. As cryptocurrency sector expands and households substitute toward cryptocurrency, national fiat currencies face growing competition from cryptocurrency, and they then strategically react to this growing competition by digitizing their currency and by launching CBDC. And notably, there's also some strategic effects in that CBDC issuance by a certain country affects the other country's incentives to issue CBDC too. Let me give, you, give a brief overview of our main results. In our baseline, we have currency competition only between national fiat currencies. And in this baseline setting, essentially there are fierce feedback effects in currency competition, which on the downside, lead to a vicious circle of depreciation and dollarization for the weakest currencies, and on the upside, leads to exorbitant privilege for the strongest currency. Now, when we add cryptocurrency to this baseline setting of currency competition, we find that the cryptocurrency sector essentially acts as a buffer zone amidst the battle of national currencies, thereby mitigating these feedback effects. As such, the rise of cryptocurrencies can actually benefit the weakest currencies as it hurts the stronger currencies and thereby reduces the competition weaker currencies may face from stronger currencies. As I said, the countries then react to the growing competition from cryptocurrency as well as from other national fiat currency by digitizing the currency, i.e. by launching or developing CBDC. And our model essentially predicts of pecking order regarding initial CBDC development, whereby countries with non-dominant currencies, but relatively strong currencies, have the highest benefits or incentives to issue CBDC, as they potentially could gain a first mover advantage. The next in line in terms of incentives is the country with the dominant or reserve currency. And the incentives of this country with the strongest currency are twofold. On the one hand, if one launches CBDC early on, one can essentially nip the cryptocurrency growth in the butt and preclude future competition from cryptocurrency. However, once cryptocurrency and other digital means of payment have gained widespread adoption, also the digitization of the reserve currency becomes unavoidable. And last, countries with very weak or non-existing sovereign currency have very low benefits to adopting CBDC, and these countries are actually better off by adopting crypto instead as a legal means of payment. We can ask whether these developments are a good thing, but what comes out of the analysis is essentially that the rise of cryptocurrencies by competing or by constituting a, a competition for national fiat currencies 
incentivizes financial innovation. You could think of the rise of cryptocurrencies be some wake up call that actually has the countries nudge to, long, uh, to look into this currency digitization more closely. The last few years, not much has happened. It has, was only since the rise of the cryptocurrencies. And we also extend our framework to study the role of stable coins or fiat backed currencies in these developments, for also exploring potential regulation of stable coins. And in the context of the country with the strongest currency, example given the US, we find that the appropriate, with the appropriate regulation of stable coins, the US can essentially capture a large part of the seniorage created from cryptocurrency or stablecoin issuance and can de facto delegate the development of a digital dollar to the private sector. Given that time is scarce, let me skip the literature review um, and go immediately into a more detailed description of the model. So we essentially consider an infinite horizon model in which time runs discreetly with time increments dt, and eventually we take the continuous time limit. The economy is populated by one representative overlapping generations household, which at birth at time t is endowed with one unit of consumption good, and this household or core t of this household would like to consume at time t plus dt. But the consumption good as such cannot be stored, so money emerges as a store of value. And in our model, money comes in the form of three currencies, which are all in fixed unit supply and have an endogenous value in consumption goods, PT to the power of X, where X stands for the specific currency. In particular, there are two national currencies, A and B, whereby we regard A as the strong or dominant currency, and we regard B as a relatively weaker or non-dominant currency. And in addition to that, there is one representative private cryptocurrency, which is not related to any of these countries. And this representative private cryptocurrency should describe the broader cryptocurrency market, including so-called stable coins. While we do not uh, provide a micro foundation for that, uh, and we essentially stipulate that Holding money entails some convenience yield. In other words, currency offers a convenience yield, which depends on the real value, mt to the power of x, of cohort t's holdings of currency x. With real value, I mean the currency holdings in terms of the consumption good, which serves as the numeraire. So what happens here? At birth, the, co the cohort t of the household invests her entire endowment into consumption good because it would like to consume late. So these three things add up to one. And there's a convenience yield to holding currency X, A, B, and there's also convenience yield Y, which we denote differently from holding cryptocurrency C. Another element is that essentially, unlike cryptocurrencies, these fiat currencies will be subject to inflation in a sense that the sovereign levies an inflation tax of its currency holders. And this inflation tax is denoted by tau to the power of x. Why do we incorporate this inflation tax? Well, this inflation tax leads then essentially to, um, should uh, essentially provide a reduced form link between a country's economic or fiscal fundamentals and the strengths of its currency. In other words, when the eco country x economic fundamentals are weak, Tau to the power of X is high and the inflation of currency X is high, so currency X is weak. So that's the rationale behind that. The household in our model is a price taker and maximizes at each point in time essentially the sum of its consumption and the convenience yield to holding money. And going through the optimization, we essentially obtain the equilibrium condition two, which simply states that the sum of marginal convenience and the expected return to holding any currency must be equal across currencies. In other words, we also assume that there's some imperfect substitutability across currencies, which is captured that this function V is essentially a concave increasing function. And let me emphasize at this point that while we model essentially the economy as one of an overlapping generation representative household, we also would like to emphasize that this household shouldn't necessarily represent many identical currency uh, individuals, but it can also represent many individuals in uh, across different locations 
that have potentially different demands for any individual currency. And that's also consistent with some individuals having no demand for, let's say, cryptocurrencies, while other individuals have some demand for cryptocurrency. And at this point, also would like to emphasize the setting is uh, flexible in a sense that it features also monetary neutrality. So these returns can be interpreted broadly. They could potentially also incorporate some interest rate earnings you could earn if you hold a specific currency. Now, let me introduce cryptocurrency. Essentially, we have stipulated that cryptocurrencies have a convenience yield Why? And the unique thing or the unique thing about cryptocurrency in this model is that the convenience of cryptocurrencies or put differently, the cryptocurrency adoption grows dynamically over time with dynamic feedback and network effects, which leads then to the exponential rise of these cryptocurrencies over time on average, as we have witnessed, let's say, in the last 10 years. So essentially, the convenience of cryptocurrency grows the more people adopt these cryptocurrencies. So if cryptocurrency adoption today is high, then we expect there's lots of development going on in this sector. So cryptocurrency price tomorrow will be high and adoption will be high and then there's some dynamic feedback effects. We also allow that fraction of the cryptocurrencies or part of the cryptocurrencies are essentially backed by fiat currency. And in this way, we essentially account for fiat backed, of, and, uh, fiat -backed stable coins, such as US dollar coin. In particular, we allow that fraction theta of the entire cryptocurrency market cap is backed by currency A. Why currency A? Well, currency A should represent the US dollar. And most of these cryptocurrencies, uh, stable coins, if they are backed at all, they are backed by US dollar assets. Last step on, in the model explanation is essentially, what, how do we think about CBDC and currency digitization? So there's many specific designs uh, uh, of CBDCs put out there. And many of you have here like uh, excellent papers or, sp or specific designs of CBDCs, the trade-off, and in particular, the implementation details. We would like to stay away from all of this. The only thing we essentially stipulate is that if country X digitizes its currency, for instance, by launching CBDC, but possibly also by other means, then the convenience to holding currency X denoted by C to the power of X increases. That's the only thing we assume. So in particular, country X launches CBDC at time TX. And before that, the convenience to holding currency X is low. After that, the convenience to holding currency X is essentially high. And developing CBDC is like a long-term project. It's akin to like some R&D. You have to go through a lot of trials and errors until you're successful. We also account for that by assuming essentially that the time at which you launch CBDC successfully is a random time, but you're more likely to succeed in launching or implementing CBDC, the more investment e to the power of X you dispense, the more effort you exert. So countries exert some effort and at some point essentially they are successful in launching CBDC, capturing that it's like a very long-term high R&D intensive project. And why does the government implement CBDC? In our model, essentially the government maximizes a time weighted average of its currency usage adoption. So essentially in loosely speaking, the government implements CBDC so as to boost the adoption or usage of its currency. And this could in reduced form essentially account also for gear geopolitical considerations, financial stability considerations and so on. For instance, if your currency is more adopted, then by market clearing it in our model means that other currencies are less adopted, which means higher adoption of your currency gives you more power in essence, gives you more power maybe to regulate, gives you more control, gives you more geopolitical power and so on. So like um, this could essentially relate, this objective could be related to all types of considerations. So this is the model setup. It's in a nutshell, and let me go essentially now through a few of our results and uh, proceed as long as time submits. We start by analyzing essentially the dynamics. The dynamics in our model is essentially that the adoption of these cryptocurrencies grows over time. So over time, in the beginning, not many people know about cryptocurrency, not many people hold it. But over time, more and more people hold some cryptocurrency, either a store of value or for liquidity services. And the convenience to holding cryptocurrency due to these network effects grows exponentially, essentially. 
So what we take away from this is essentially that the currency value of the strongest currency is unambiguously harmed by the rise of cryptocurrency. As cryptocurrency grow, household substitute away from both currencies, but this harms um, relatively more the country with the strongest currencies. Another takeaway is essentially that currency B, the weaker currency, faces both competition from currency A, the strongest currency, and competition from currency C. Now, when there is more cryptocurrency adoption, currency A becomes weaker. So currency B faces less competition from A, but more competition from C. And depending on how weak currency B is, it may actually benefit from the rise of cryptocurrency. And we see this when we plot this, uh, essentially, the currency values A and B. Currency value of A decreases with Y. Currency value of B can be hump-shaped with respect to Y. And currency value C increases with Y. Another key observation our model is that cryptocurrencies are only adopted if national fiat currencies are weak, either regarding their convenience or because they have a high inflation. And in particular, what this implies is that cryptocurrencies emerge endogenously to fill a vacuum in the currency space. And in particular, the weakness of these national currencies would facilitate the growth of the cryptocurrency sector. My next point is essentially, as cryptocurrency adoption grows over time, both countries face increasing competition from uh, cryptocurrencies and lose a little bit of adoption of their own currency. Now, countries strategically react to this growing competition by digitizing their currency and by launching CBDC, which is in our model captured by the effort, E to the power of A for country A and E to the power of B for country B. One key result of our framework is essentially that as long as currency B is not too weak, country B always has higher incentives to issue CBDC. Or put it in less normative terms, country B or currency B benefits more from the digitization of their currency as there is a potential first mover advantage to be gained. Country A has weaker incentives, but the incentives of the country A are essentially derived from uh, are mostly to compete with cryptocurrency or other countries' CBDCs. And the incentives of country A displayed in panel A are essentially follow this um, two-peak chain. What is the rationale behind this? Well, if country A were to launch CBDC early on, it would essentially nip future cryptocurrency grows in the bud and conduct some killer acquisition or killer adoption of the cryptocurrency technology. In other words, the first peak of the incentives of country A derive from a potential to nip the cryptocurrency growth in the bud. There is some cryptocurrency kill zone. A launch of CBDC by a country with a strong currency early on precludes any future cryptocurrency growth. However, once the cryptocurrency market has gained sufficiently high adoption and Y is high, then the digitization of currency A becomes unavoidable. And this explains essentially the second peak. Similarly, we essentially would like to relate a con as the, the strengths of a country's currency to uh, the incentives to develop CBDC, which is similar to what we have done before. In this graph, Pi B essentially quantifies the strengths of country B's currency in a sense that when Pi B is large, currency B is weak, and when Pi B is low, currency B is strong. And now we look at the average effort which captures the incentives or the benefits for country B to launch CBDC as a function of Pi B. And we see that there's an inverted U shape. What does this mean? When currency B or when the currency is sufficiently strong, the incentives to launch CBDC are relatively low. When the currency B is sufficiently, uh, sufficiently weak, then the incentives to launch CBDC are low too. But when currency B strength is at intermediate levels, then there's a peak and the incentives to launch CBDC are relatively strong. 
And this gives rise to a pecking order. In particular, this pecking order regarding initial CBDC issuance states that countries with strong but non-dominant currencies have the largest incentives to launch CBDC and, they benefit, and their currencies benefit the most. Again, because they could potentially gain a first move advantage. The country with the strongest currency, the US dollar, uh, the, the US with its US dollar, is the next in line in terms of incentives to launch CBDC. And last, countries with very weak currencies, such as El Salvador, have very weak or very low incentives and do not benefit much from launching CBDC as their currency is weak regardless. And at this point, maybe I would like to mention that this inverted U-shape um, regarding, uh, regarding some innovation, we notice from the economics literature, and that's kind of like a little bit similar. If the currency degree of currency competition is very low because Pi B is high, then there's not much effort. If the degree of currency competition is very high because Pi B is low, there's uh, also not a lot of effort. But if there's intermediate level of competition, then we get also the highest efforts to digitize money. So this is like um, reminiscent of some classical uh, results in innovation theory. So the pecking order we suggest is kind of also consistent with the state of CBDC um, initiatives around the globe. We see countries like China having, um, uh, having already launched a pilot regarding CBDC issuance, rega uh, uh, remarkably a large scale pilot, whereas the US still lags a bit behind also China, also Canada, and also the Eurozone, where I recently heard that the digital euro is about to come in four years by Panetta. Now, we also would like to ask, is currency digitization or CBDC issuance strategic substitutes or is it strategic complements? And to do so, we look essentially at the change in A's incentives to digitize the currency if B successfully launches CBDC. Likewise, we look at the change in country B's incentives to launch CBDC, country B is the weaker country, if A, the strong country, launches CBDC successfully. We find essentially the following. If the country with the strongest currency issues CBDC, then the weaker country's incentives to launch CBDC decrease giving rise to strategic substitutability. Why is that? The weaker countries' incentives to launch CBDC derive mainly from the desire to gain a first mover advantage. So if country A, the stronger country, already launches CBDC, it clearly wipes out such a first mover advantage. And second, it is interesting that if country B, a country with maybe a relatively weaker but non and non-dominant currency launches CBDC, then it can either increase or decrease the incentives of the country with the strongest currency to launch CBDC, so that CBDC issuance can be strategic substitutes or strategic complements depending on the circumstances. In particular, if the launch of CBDC comes from a sufficiently strong country B, then it challenges the dominance of currency A and is more likely to increase A's incentives to launch CBDC. And these trade-offs kind of feature prominently in policy debates. It's not clear how the launch of the Chinese renminbi will affect the dominance of the US dollar. And there's essentially opposite views on that. And there's also opposite views of that, of whether the US should react to the launch of CBDC by other countries. On the pro side, Ehrlich 2020 in Forbes says essentially, calls essentially for action to actively research a digital dollar reflecting the concern that the ECNY might challenge the USD dominance. And related to that, President Biden signed this executive to order in which he also called federal agencies to look into this digital dollar. On the other hand, we have Daryl Duffy, who does not, uh, um, who thinks differently in a sense that also that the, the ECNY probably has no, um, is no danger for US dollar dominance. And he, the, while he is pretty much in favor for CBDC issuance, he definitely warrants some caution <laughs> that a digital dollar should be definitely well considered and well planned. So um, let me almost come to the end. Essentially, the story of our paper is that as cryptocurrencies are adopted over time and their convenience grows, national currencies face competition from these cryptocurrencies and are essentially forced 
to digitize the currency by launching CBDC. Similarly, when countries launch CBDC, then they also put some pressure on other countries to react as well, which further increases essentially the, incentive, the overall incentives to develop CBDC. So essentially, in the model, what is happening that the rise of these cryptocurrencies acts as a catalysator for financial innovation. In the beginning, these cryptocurrencies grow and cryptocurrencies and stablecoins as such can already be seen as a financial innovation. So you could say there's already some positive effect on financial innovation and payment innovation, but it does not stop there because this competition in the currency space also urges countries with any type of currencies to digitize their currency. And overall, what we can conclude is that the rise of these cryptocurrencies, including so-called stable coins as such can be seen as a catalysator for financial innovation. And it triggers or it stimulates financial innovation both in the private and in the public sector. In the public sector, it would be the launch of CBDC. And finally, let me maybe uh, come back to the role of these fiat-backed uh, cryptocurrencies and stable coins. In practice, many stable coins are packed to the US dollar, and some of them, some of the largest ones at least, are partially backed by US dollar reserves. Obviously, we have seen a failure of a non backed uh, stable coin, Terra, two weeks back which essentially was not backed to anything. And the reserves of some of these uh, backed and packed stable coins may include cash or cash equivalents of US dollars. Examples of that, as I said, US dollar coin or Binance US dollar, which are number two and number three, I think at this point. And we can actually study the role of stable coins as we consider that fraction theta of cryptocurrency market cap P to the power of C is backed by reserves consisting of currency A. And while I don't have time to go into this graph in detail, I would like to say that the fact that essentially some cryptocurrencies are backed by fiat currency of country A is a good thing for country A. Essentially, it raises the rise of cryptocurrencies, raises then the demand for currency A in some sense, as currency A is a reserve for these cryptocurrencies. And in particular, the rise of stablecoins backed by currency A, think of A as the US dollar, benefit the currency A, the US dollar, but harm at the relatively weaker currency B. And we can also then, again, look at countries' optimal incentives or optimal investment to research or research CBDC or to digitize the currency. And we find that essentially that requiring by regulation a backing of stable coins can be seen as an alternative to developing their own CBDC. In other words, if the US were to regulate stablecoins and require them to be backed, say, by 100% uh, US dollar cash or cash equivalents, then the US could effectively delegate the digital dollar development in the sense that the private stablecoin issuers do all the legwork. They create a digital dollar, which is backed by physical US dollars, and export it to other countries, potentially. This point, let me conclude. In this way, we study essentially a dynamic model of currency competition between national fiat currencies cryptocurrencies, and in particular also between, um, between CBDC. Countries react to the growing competition from cryptocurrency by digitizing the currency and strategically issuing CBDC. In particular, the strategic effects also depend on whether other countries have launched CBDC. The model essentially predicts a novel pegging order of, uh, regarding initial CBDC issuance with countries with strong but non-dominant currencies spearheading their endeavors, followed by countries with the strongest currencies and which are again followed by countries with the weakest currencies. Countries with relatively weak currencies can actually benefit from the rise of cryptocurrency, but as I have not discussed, might be prone to digital dollarization in the long run. And regardless, the digitization of money probably becomes unavoidable in the long run. Thank you so much for your attention. Look very much forward to Jesus' discussion and to any questions afterwards. Thanks a lot, Simon. So let's now turn oh, to... Oh, was too long, yeah. <laughs> let's now turn to Jesus. Uh, Jesus, you have 10 minutes uh, for the discussion. Yeah. You can, uh, Thanks a lot. Okay, let me do this. Okay. Everyone can see the slides? You can hear me? Very good. So let me uh, enter into discussion of the paper. Okay. 
Yes, I needed something so I keep track of the time. So let me briefly describe, uh, summarize. Oh. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> so let me briefly uh, describe, uh, summarize the environment of the model. So what um, Simon has presented is a model of dynamic competition among two national fiat currencies, a strong and a weak, a representative uh, cryptocurrency, and CBDCs. And in this paper, CBDCs are better version of the national fiat currency. They are somewhat, somehow easier and better to use. The model is an OLG model in the tradition of Karekin and Wallace, where money is used for trading uh, among generations. And we have governments that levy taxes and maximize the discounted value of seniorage over time. And the solution concept that uh, we deal with is a mark of equilibria. And this help us to think a little bit about the evolution of these different currencies and the competition among them over time. The paper delivers five main results. So the first one, which is quite intuitive, is that cryptocurrencies harm the strong currency, but may benefit the weaker currency. So a way I like to think about this result is I'm the uh, US government. I'm actually getting a lot of seniorage revenue from issuing the world reserve currency, the strong currency. That's what historically people have talked as the uh, exorbitant privilege. And uh, one second, I have... Uh, okay, yes, so you say that the slides are not moving and I know what is happening. It's because when I, when I do, the, when I do the, the share screen on... Uh, on and the full screen on, on, on Apple, it just doesn't work. Uh, do you see them moving now? Yes. Okay. Now we see them. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that, that's, that's the problem. You cannot really use. There is something between Zoom and, and Apple computers that they don't like each other. That's why I didn't want to, to put them in, in, in full screen before. Okay. So I was saying that the main result, the first main result is that cryptocurrencies harm the strong currency, but may benefit the weaker currency. And the argument here is very simple. Think about the US as having the so-called exorbitant privilege is getting seniorage from issuing the main currency, the strong currency in the world. And suddenly you have Bitcoin or any other type of uh, cryptocurrency entering into that market and that it's part of the seniorage. And under some combination of parameter values, it may benefit the weaker currency because what you have is that there is a better comparative or the relative price of using the weaker uh, currency goes down. The second main result is that um, the weak CBDC is a greater threat to cryptocurrencies. We use Bitcoin because we think it's a better alternative to US dollar, but suddenly we are going to have the e RMB or the e um, dollar, the electronic dollar, and that there basically uh, eliminates the reason to switch to a cryptocurrency. The third main result is that there is a pecking order of CBD issuance. So the first country who wants to get into this business is the country that issues a weak currency, although not a currency that is too weak. The second one will be the US, the issuer of the strong currency. And the third one will be the issuer of the um, uh, countries that have really, really are at the, at, at the very bottom, such as El Salvador. And um, there is also a fourth and fifth results. One is that uh, there is the financial innovation is higher in the country with a weaker currency. And that kind of makes sense. Um, China cannot get a lot of this exorbitant privilege of the US. So there is a more incentive in China to, the, to come up with better financial arrangements. And uh, stable coins may favor the strong currency. And here the reason is to issue a uh, stable coin, you need some dollar backing, which indirectly increases the demand for the US dollar, and then it makes it uh, a little bit stronger. So I always like to talk about these papers on um, currency competition, going back, of course, to this lad, who is F.A. Hayek. And, in the, the Nationalization of Money, which is a book that I always encourage people to read because I really think it was 40 years ahead of its time 
it was published originally in 1976, although here I'm quoting the version from 1999 from the collected works. Hayek thinks about a lot of these issues, not in a mathematical way, it's a verbal model, but nonetheless, a very interesting one. And he has this great quote where he says, I have always found it useful to explain to students that it has been rather a misfortune that we describe money by a noun and that it will be more helpful for the explanation of monetary phenomena if money were an objective. And he basically says, because in that way, we are going to have different monies or we are going to have different assets with different degrees of moneyness. And we can really think about how these assets compete with each other. And this is in some sense, the main lesson that you get from this paper. In this paper, you have all these different types of monies that compete among themselves. And that of course makes up for a wonderful paper and a great read and I really enjoyed uh, going over it over the last few days. And in addition to it, the results of the paper are very intuitive as I think I was able to summarize before. And something that I like a lot about the paper as well is that the authors are always very nuanced in their statements and they try to highlight the strengths of the model and venues for possible improvement, which is actually really very nice. So what type of, you know, uh, trying to build and try to be constructive on things that I, I think would make the paper even better, I have basically three main comments. Uh, the first one is that in this paper, uh, a CBDC is modeled as a better fiat currency. Basically, the authors think about the a CBDC as a currency, as a fiat currency that has a convenience yield that is higher. Uh, on the other hand, the CBDC is a costly uh, technology, its arrival is random, and you know, there are good motivations for these uh, two hypotheses, which are quite sensible. On the other hand, one could be worried that they also present a best case scenario of for what a CBDC is. Okay, so yes, a CBDC is uh, easier to use. I just go to my cell phone, to my iPhone, and I use an app to pay with my CBDC. But on the other hand, um, there are no uh, issues related with privacy concerns within the paper. If I have a CBDC, suddenly the government fully knows what I'm doing in every single moment of my life. There is no issues related with financial stability, which is something that I have worked a lot with uh, Linda Schilling, Harald Ulick, and Daniel Sanchez. There is no considerations of political economy and how the fact that suddenly the government is going to be involved in uh, this very large set of transactions can change the incentives of everyone within the system. And there is no commitment problems. And in particular, um, this worries me uh, quite a bit because something that people don't quite seem to uh, fully appreciate is that with a CBDC, the government can change its mind overnight, go to the accounts of absolutely everyone in the world and with just pressing a button, making our assets or our currencies disappear. And we actually have seen the Chinese government doing something somewhat similar during the last few months. So let me put my hat as an econometrician for a second and try to highlight that it's likely that all those factors are going to correlate with being a weak currency to begin with. So why does the Chinese currency is considered weak in international markets? It's not that China is a poor country or is a small country. What makes a lot of users very concerned about the Chinese currency is this. This is a photograph about the type of cages that were set up in uh, Shanghai during the recent lockdown and the total, um, I will say rather reckless disregard of anything that uh, resemble the rule of law. So if I'm a big investor, I'm thinking about where to put my money, or even if I'm a retailer investor, and I'm thinking about how to allocate my currencies, it's not as much that I care about the uh, convenience yield of a currency. I'm worried about the Chinese government tomorrow completely defaulting on its obligations or more importantly, changing the rules of the game. And that's why the Chinese currency is a weak currency. And just by making it um, a digital currency is not really going to change the situation. 
Now, the good thing is that this type of correlation with being a, a, a weak currency could be incorporated into the paper. I could imagine an extension where, yes, the weak country the, uh, and the weak currencies introduced has a higher convenience yield, but maybe there is some probability of a default. And given that at the end of the day, the paper is going to deal with a numerical solution, that probability of default is something that is quite possible uh, to deal with. And that will be a really, really nice extension of the paper, which I have not really seen in, in any other paper so far. So that will really make the paper very interesting. Jesus, two minutes. Yeah, thank you. The second, the second comment is that the paper jumps between being a paper on applied theory and a paper that has a little bit of quantitative theory, but not too much. So on one hand, the model is very, very deftly, deftly crafted to allow for a lot of uh, uh, theoretical analysis in the tradition of applied theory. But at the end of the day, as we saw during the presentation, one needs to also do a little bit of numerics. And I think that if the, the authors could you know, push the paper, push the numerics a little bit more, think a little bit more carefully about what these parameters mean, think about what some of these quantities mean, that will add a lot to the appeal of the paper. Now, I know that some of these parameters are going to be difficult to match to the data. Some of these things are about the stuff that we haven't really seen. So it's not that here I'm going to be looking for a super tight discussion of parameter values, but I think that spending a little bit of time on that will really, really help the paper a lot. And my last comment is that, as I was saying at the beginning, the paper uses an overlapping generation model, uh, a la, in particular in the recent formulation of he and Krishnamurthy, which is a very nice way to do these things. OLG models of money are a very simple setup that illuminate a lot, but one would like to think a little bit of, have a little bit of a sense of how the results are robust to some alternative environments, like a search environment, some type of Lagos right environment, some type of turnpike environment. I think that extending the results to turnpike will be relatively straightforward. And Simon, I think, mentioned that during his presentation. But I would like to, you know, if, if we were going to think in a slightly different uh, environment, will will all these ideas go through? And if the paper could make that point, I think it will make uh, the reader much, much more satisfied. Let me stop here because I just got to my limit one second ago. Thanks a lot, Jesus. Uh, very useful. So I'd like to now open up the floor to the participants. And uh, please uh, feel free to, to jump in. I see we don't have any questions yet in the Q&A, but, uh, but for those who are um, on as, uh, as participants, uh, please uh, feel free to, um, to raise your hand and I'll, uh, I'll call on whoever would like to speak first. Who'd like to break the ice? I'll do it. Yeah. Ah, okay, uh, Ricardo was first. Ricardo first. Yeah, so uh, a general question. So about, um, it always makes me a bit uneasy when people want to study currency substitution and then the degree of substitutability to the currencies is hardwired in utility functions. I mean, so why did you take that route? A lot of the extensions that Jesus was mentioning are buried in that utility function. You know, how worried, I mean, you call them convenience yields. It could be you're worried about rule of law. It could be anything. I mean, and, and you're looking at these like long dynamic transitions and that's kept constant and what is it? And then we have, you know, taking advantage of the decreasing returns on each separate module, you know what I'm saying? Yes. I mean, you could, you could do something, okay. So you see the point. I mean, even if you did something reduced for me, maybe it'd be better to have some like a fancy aggregator. Of course, I would still complain about, you know, the parameters of the aggregator are constant, but but at least you know something more along those lines. Or, yeah. Yeah. So no, that, that's a very um, good comment, and like uh, was expecting to get this obviously from the audience. And this, but yeah, so like um, we don't microfound these things, uh, this utility function well, and like that's definitely also as mentioned in Hesos uh, discussion. It would um, it would be definitely something we would like to explore in the future. Like it would make things, uh, I guess, uh, I'm not sure whether it would like uh, easily come back to the money in the utility function if we, for instance, were to use your framework at Lagos and Wright uh, to microfound it. But uh, indeed, like we would like to check the robustness in this direction. We expect the results to go through, but uh, we still have to look at it. That's So I'll say a follow-up. Maybe I'm, I'm more than breaking the ice now. But the, so the follow-up yeah. is, I mean, this device of having money in the utility function it was believed for a long time mm -hmm. that for, you know, once a currency regime is in place, 
you know, the nuances of the micro foundations of that might not matter for little blips on monetary yeah. policy. But now we're using that to talk about monetary regimes. It makes me more uneasy. You know, like, oh, I, so that's, yeah. I mean, so all my, I'm concerned even about the former, but in this context, I mean, even more, you know, that, that, that's all. Uh, no, no, no. So I think this is, this is a very good point. I have not thought about this because especially when we're talking about changes, then indeed, like, uh, it's unclear that the functional form will still be the same as before. Thus, uh, uh, calling essentially for a micro foundation. I, I definitely well taken this point. I have not thought about this, uh, that we, we don't account for that, unfortunately, in this current version. Okay, so I see that um, Todd had a question as well. We'll call on Todd and then Scott Hendry. So, Todd? Yeah, uh, yeah, thanks. So, Simon, how, how do you want us to think about the dollars in the model? Is this, is this currency? Is this M1? Does it include government debt? And, and I'm trying to think about, because when I think about these different things in practice, if, you know, I, if I think about what Bitcoin is competing with mm -hmm. and what are the sources of the government seniorage revenue, in practice, it seems like those aren't always perfectly aligned, right? You know, the seniorage right. revenue is, is, is coming from, from the currency and perhaps, you know, from the interest rate on the government debt and Bitcoin or stable coins even might be competing more with, with bank deposits. So, so how should I think about that? Um, a very broad interpretation of the dollar would be the most applicable one in that sense. So you want to very... sort of all of these things together? Yes, I mean, it should be, uh, we, 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 see, we envision here like a very broad interpretation, for instance, of the US, uh, I mean, of the currency as such, which also would include like um, all of these cash equivalents you mentioned. Yeah, okay. But yeah, so indeed, also in this, um, yeah, so also in this dimension, the paper was somewhat short in, in providing some uh, probably satisfactory micro foundation. Yeah, okay. I, I was, yeah. yeah. I was thinking of it as being different from the micro foundations question. That might be interesting to think about, you know, just the distinctions between different types of, of dollars and, and where cryptocurrency is competing. And again, to what extent that's where the government's worried about seniorage revenue and to what extent it's, it's having other effects on the economy. I mean, it could be like something maybe to, to add to this, not sure whether one could uh, convincingly make this point, but uh, I'm always thinking about it also. It couldn't, uh, Essentially, also, it's somewhat competing with US dollar denominated assets. And right. um, probably in some way would mm -hmm. also like essentially we were aggregate all the holdings in terms of US dollar, then it would somewhat because you switch out of US dollar denominated assets towards something in crypto, then would uh, uh, indirectly also eat into the senior rush. Mm -hmm. I would have to. Yeah, uh, okay, okay. It's like kind of a very difficult to say. Also, in this current stages of these cryptocurrencies, it's very diffi difficult to uh, to pin down. But it's a very well taken point. Okay, thanks. So next, we have a question from Scott Hendry, and I was going to read it out, but I see that Scott has just been promoted to a panelist, so he can uh, he can mm -hmm. say the question himself. <laughs> Scott, go ahead. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. It's Scott Hendry with the Bank of Canada. So I had two questions actually. The first one is about uh, whether or not there's any real network effect going on in the uh, the currency model of the payment system. So are the citizens of country A biased towards using currency A or CBDC A the way uh, they would be in the, the current double-sided network that exists in payments? And a secondary question is wondering whether the presence of commercial bank money would change any of the setup here. Like a lot of the discussion is around uh, thinking about it solely as central bank money. And I'm wondering whether that just is a, is a tweak or uh, whether it changes anything fundamental. Thanks. Yeah, so the first question, yeah, these network effects are kind of, uh, why not explicitly modeled? They're kind of there. So I, I, even the first question, I thought it's like two questions. So first of all, you uh, does the model account, for instance, that some citizens would have like, uh, let's say, does the model account for that US citizens have a high demand for US dollars, but no demand for the Chinese yen? Uh, that's what I at least understood. Like uh, that would be accounted for by this representative household in reduced form. The second one, network effects happen via uh, kind of the inflation in the model, like or inflation tax, how we put it. The more people hold a specific currency, then the currency kind of appreciates. 
and then um, there's less inflation. So you uh, another individual is more willing to hold this currency. So like essentially this would be an endogenous network effect. But it's not, uh, again, not a micro network effect. You could think of via some search and matching model, which could uh, would then make the results even stronger in that regard. So the second question was um, commercial bank money. And that I think was like, related to Todd Kester's uh, question as well. well. Yeah, so like we don't account for it in expli explicitly. But I would think it would fit in there, kind of like it's it's very we have to think about it, yeah. But uh, Simon, so maybe something related to Scott and maybe talk question is um we, we see for example in El Salvador, so the big bank, they are also the global bank usually, like uh Citibank is the biggest one, the HFBC, mm -hmm. they have branches in El Salvador, and then they can um issuing the uh inside money in both U.S. and El Salvador as well. So then the, the question might be maybe more involved and also more interesting when the global bank, which exists in a lot of emerging country, uh, and then mix up with the issue of issuing CBDC along uh, the cross countries build over dimension. So uh, maybe this, um, maybe Scott, uh, one of the uh, thing he's thinking. I guess. I guess that's what uh, what uh, what the yeah. most two of these questions uh, were in this line. I, I feel. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would almost say, even though it's like not the best answer, probably to this question, that like um, it would require some additional modeling and some additional account. So like the current setting, like doesn't account for that at all. But let's say if we merge the government and like the banks of this of the country so essentially then uh, if you add up the senior rush uh, right but something maybe different is uh, for for the us government the fed cannot issue a uh, 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 currency in el salvador yes but uh, but a global bank it can because it can operate in both el salvador and, and the us and they can uh issue some inside money so it make the uh the interaction might be more involved and also interesting. Yes. I just tell a very simple point. Yeah. I think it's what Scott might be have in mind for his second question. Yeah. But but, I was, yeah, that was a little more complicated uh, the version that you uh, put forward, Russell, but uh, it's good nuance to it. Thanks. No, it's definitely well taken this point, like uh, kind of beyond the scope of this current version. We have not thought about it, but probably would be interesting to explore in this direction because uh, I mean, as Sab yeah, so like in this sense, uh, you couldn't get uh, whether you could, that's the question, and like how would these global banks uh, do this inside money creation? Which currency is it denominated? Like if you do, if HSBC has a branch in El Salvador, can you have a, a US checking account? That's. Uh... So I'm uh, conscious that some people will have a hard stop at, uh, at the hour. So um, we agreed uh, on the organizers that those who uh, have time would like to stay on and uh, talk to Simon a little bit longer. I, I guess that Simon uh, does still have a few minutes. So I have, uh, uh, unlimited time. Yeah. So like, I think uh, there's so another uh, hand raised by Huberto Ennis. Uh, very good. So I will uh, let you guys uh, continue, yeah. and I think that uh, uh, Jonathan will uh, will take over and um, and uh, moderate uh, going forward. So um, yeah, let's call on uh, on Huberto and then um, let uh, let Jonathan take it from there. Go ahead, Hubert. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for hosting. Yeah. All right. Nice, nice presentation, Simon. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no, I and this is really quickly. It's not really a, a question, but uh, following up on Jesus and and maybe Ricardo too. Um, you know, this came up with when uh, you talked about which one is the dominant. You know. Like yes. in a way, it really matters how you micro found things because then that kind of uh, Jesus point was well that may matter for what happened to the to the CBDC in that country. You know, depending on what the micro foundations for the initial dominance. So I think that's kind of a really fruitful uh, area to think more about. You know, but it's just reinforcing what Jesus and and. And uh -huh. Ricardo, yeah, so like indeed. Yeah, yeah so we, we are indeed planning like to dive into this micro foundation also following the standard frameworks, uh, like was right, for instance. Yeah, thanks for the comment. Thank you, great presentation.
Oh, okay, maybe I will take over as the moderator at this point. I think there's another question. In there's the one question in the Q&A as Larry. far as I see it. Uh, Larry is not here anymore, but uh, he's basically asking for, maybe there's uh, also a, a incentive for central bank not to offer uh, CBDCs to non-residents, right? Such as to maybe you need to enforce uh, KYC uh, in a foreign market. So have you kind of thought about these uh, considerations? Yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, okay, so like, um, yeah, the model cannot speak to that, unfortunately, because we don't take uh, much of a stance on any CBDC design and implementation, which also includes whether you make the CBDC publicly available to non-residents or residents. Adding to that, the model essentially, like we have a one representative household, which represents, which is a, can be seen as a global household and represents citizens around the globe. But we don't draw essentially the, the, the borders between the countries. But it could be, this could be incorporated. On the other hand, like then uh, um, still we don't take a stance on a specific CBDC design. Um, maybe like more from the policies that I would always be interested, I mean, to hear like, most CBDCs seem to me like in the beginning, at least they should be uh, mostly for uh, national use, as far as I understand. Okay, thank you, Smut. Uh, I don't know if there are any final questions, comments. If no, maybe uh, uh, let um, Todd conclude the session. Thank you. Okay, so thanks, Simone, for a great presentation. Thanks. thanks, everybody, for participating. I'll just put in a quick plug for our next session, five weeks from today on June 24th. Charlie Kahn's going to talk about expiring CBDC and loss recovery. Steve Williamson will be the discussant, and Will Roberts is going to be our host. So until then, have a good evening or day or morning, wherever you are. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thanks, everyone, for attending, and thanks for inviting me to present the paper.